Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is much too far. We have to go back. I want to tell you something. Ah, oh, this is not very good. Okay. So, uh, I want to tell you something about priming, because priming is everywhere. And if you take this atmosphere, take the number of women here, young women, exciting women, this all primes. It primes totally different, probably me, other males in here, or you as a woman. The color in this room will prime you, the music will prime you, and it all will finally lead to different kinds of decision. To my personal opinion, priming is something which is totally unknown in, in its dimensions. It's extremely powerful, underestimated, and it's a real modificator of human decision making. What I will going to do with you, I will show you a few facts and will do with you a, a small experiments and you all have to join in, otherwise it won't work. It worked quite nice with my students a week ago. So we start first with an egg. Experiment. This is the audience here, and I ask half of the audience, that means the audience on the right side for me here, to close the eyes for a few seconds. The best thing is you hold your hand up, then I can see how many are really joining in. And, okay, close your eyes, keep it closed. You can open your eyes again. Now the other half has to close the eyes, so on my left side, close your eyes. Okay, so keep it closed, keep it closed. Still keep it closed. Okay, so we go on now with the definition. What is priming? It's an upstream stimulus in your decision making, not realized at all, usually implicit, as we call it, results in an implicit memory consolidation, which in consequence may influence a downstream behavior considerably. And these are the experiments I'm going to show you. These phenomena are totally underestimated. Now, first, I want to show you a film we did for the German television once. And it's a very simple thing. There were two groups of, pay, of, of probands, and these probands had to change sentences which were not in a correct grammatical manner. And finally, after this, we measured the time they took for a way to drop in their sheet. So we'll see it here. We don't have acoustics here, huh? Now it was just strong grammatical order, and the difference between the two groups was that in one group there were words in it like old, like gray, like ill, like old, and the, a bit negative words, and somehow related to age. Für unser Experiment haben wir den langen Gang zur Rennstrecke gemacht, aber unsere Versuchsteilnehmer wissen nichts davon. Wir messen die Zeit, reichen unsere Schlüsselworte aus, um womöglich eine ganze Gruppe langsamer zu machen. Guten Tag und herzlich willkommen zur großen Show der Naturwunder und zu unserem Versuch. Immer wieder dasselbe Muster. Eine Person nach der anderen löst fleißig das einfache Satzpuzzle. Bei den einen mit den Altersschlüsselwörtern, bei den anderen ohne. Und dann kommt unser geheimer Test. Ein einfacher Auftrag. Den Zettel bitte hinten am Ende des Ganges noch in den Kasten werfen. Alles klar, vielen Dank. Ich mich herzlich. Auf Wiedersehen. So, I get a sign, I have to speed up, so I finish the film here. Jetzt. And just tell you the result. The result is that the people who had words with old, gray, and ill uh, tended to go about 15 to 20 percent slower when they dropped their leaflet in a 10 meter distance in a box. So this is an experiment on priming. So you're dealing with a thing upstream, which are words, and these words have some meanings, and in an implicit way, unconscious way, you take the meaning of these words and you change your behavior afterwards according to this. A few more of these experiments I show you. This is a Germany, at least a rather famous book, and Helmut Schmidt, the former chancellor, tried to put Per Steinberg in a good position. And I'm citing a sentence, I feel um, there is a need for a seriousness and substance, and this is mirrored in the public attention to you, Per. And Per Steinberg answered, both may be right. There may be a desire for substance and experience, but there's also a desire for visible personality. What do you feel when you read this? You feel a bit embarrassed. It's too much. It's over-priming. So, and this over-priming goes so far that the journalists take the chess 
here, and they found out that the positions of the figures in the chess were not correct, and they were laughing on this. So it was a negative priming, and the intention was, and this is the thing, intentional priming must be very well dosed, not like Maria did it with me before. So <laughs> other things are things like anchoring. Just consider the fact you are a judge, and you should sentence a shoplifter. You get a number from an explicitly named independent source. A journalist calls you and says, ah, for this shoplifter, three months is good enough. Another uh, person in this round is called, four months is better, or five months is better. And the other source for numbers was dicing. So somebody was dicing, saying, I diced a six, and he gave it to the judge. And do you think there's any influence on the judge, on the sentencing, the shoplifter? You probably think no, but this is so. The proposals depended on previously presented numbers, which were minutes ago presented, totally independent, and this was set, this is totally independent. So if the judge had a dicing number of six, the poor guy, the shoplifter, got six months, and if he had a dicing of one, he had one month. So this is dicing. Another kind of dicing, how it's related to emotions, it's done this experiment. There were people, and consider yourself, you beings, a patron in a public library, and you watch a disgusting video about slaughtering. And finally, there could be a difference in decision. What do you think if you may show your emotions, talk with others about your emotion, about the firm of slaughtering or not, or don't show your emotions. You are not allowed to talk about it. You can't share your bad feelings with this. So finally, if you detest under this condition too, this reduces severely the uh, psychosocial behavior of these. Lower donation for the next participant in a certain game, lower donation for charity, and less feelings of guilt doing this. So just seeing a film, not being able to talk about the negative aspects of the film. So emotional timing determines behavior considerably in the following. And there's another experiment, very simple. Consider you are coming into your job and somebody tells you, ah, oh, you're looking a bit sad today. I think it will be a difficult day for you. Are you unhappy? Are you depressed? Or in another occasion, somebody comes, we have a very difficult task for you. I'm not quite sure whether you make this task, but you can have a try. So you have negative priming, a certain person, number, numbers of person, and positive priming. Oh, you're looking very clever. You will do the job. Or you're looking very happy today. It will be nice for you and easy for you to do the job finally. And if you go into the brain afterwards, and you're not looking at the successes in this task we do in the fMRI, so you're looking about the mistakes and the people who were primed half an hour before on sad or stupid, they have a huge activation in this area, which is a yellow sign here, and this area is the so-called insula of the cortex, and there you have extremely bad feeling. For example, if pain becomes very unpleasant, this region is activated. So you consider now that mobbing, what, hap what happens when mobbing is done to a person in a certain environment. These were all things done half an hour before. A very simple everyday experience is my final situation here, the post-buying satisfaction. There's an experimental situation and somebody can buy in this experimental situation um, a song and he pays for the song 38 cent or euros or whatever. And in the other case, another person also buys the song for the same amount of money and he is very dissatisfied. Now, if you measure things in the brain, at the same time you have a huge activation with this post-buying satisfaction in the reward system, the patient feels very good, but you can't see any difference between these two situations. That's quite clear, but if I take it, the first person had known that the store price of this song was one euro something. In the other case, this was something where he could make a bargain and it was just 40 cents. So in one case, there was savings only two cents. In the other case, the savings were 91 cents. And this makes all the difference in the feeling. And that's how people manipulate you if you buy in sales situations. Now again, I want to ask you, and firstly, I want to ask this side on the right side. Do you think 
of this person here. You know, it all is Jack Nicholson. Jack Nicholson is he a good guy or a bad guy in the situation? Just the right side here, who has closed the eyes, open, brings up the arm. If this is a good guy, it's only a few. Now on the other side, oh, it's a bit more. And if I have the choice for the bad guy, what's here? Bad guy, this is overwhelming on this side. And so the different pictures you saw here, this is left and this is right. This is both the same woman and one time looking very friendly, the other time looking very aggressively. And even in this very uncontrolled situation, you see a difference in behavior about 10 or 15 minutes later. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, you're going, I, I, I presume you have some questions that came up, and we will have the opportunity, you will have the opportunity to ask questions at the end when all three um, experts will have. Yeah, I'll, I'll call you. Oh, you want to sit down already? No, 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 I sit down here. You prefer? Later on, yeah. All right, okay. So, uh, next I would like to call up on stage uh, Dr. Anneliese Schwenkhagen. He is, she is a, an expert when it comes to female hormonal affairs. She's an expert on uh, sexual disorders. And I thought, let's talk about sex. I mean, at the end of the day, we read about sex, we hear about sex all over, and we uh, tend to hear that having regularly very satisfying sex is the normal thing, and everything else should be treated. And she, from her experience, knows that this is a uh, obviously putting a lot of pressure on us. And of course, everything she can tell us about how our female brain is influenced by the hormones, I think is very exciting. Please, Anneliese yeah. Schwenkhagen, come up. Well, thank you for this nice introduction. And um, well, if you look at this up here, it says new rules, new values. And um, I'd like to start my talk with a very brief historical view of attitudes to female sexuality. Um, let's focus on, for a couple of seconds or minutes, on the 19th century. Um, in the 19th century, it was thought that menstru menstruation and sexuality have a very deleterious effect on intellect in women. And there were all those funny diseases like menstrual madness, nymphomania, masturbation, moral insanity, hysteria, and neurasthenia. And many of those diseases were thought to be the result of inappropriate reading or playing music. But it comes worse. Um, cause of all evil was considered to be the clitoris or, to be more precise, masturbation. This was perfectly okay for men, it wasn't for women. So the cure was either for menstrual madness, for example, we call it PMS today, removal of the ovaries, or removal of the clitoris. And I'm serious about this. Um, there is a little book about this, published by Baker Brown um, uh, in the 19th century. And in this book he says, um, Clitoridectomy is a cure for all those diseases, for nymphomania, for masturbation, for hysteria, for epilepsy, catalepsy, for depression, insanity, dementia, you name it. And I'd like to give you two examples taken from this little book of the indications for those surgeries. Um, this is my first example, a woman, middle-aged. There was evidence of peripheral excitement I performed my usual operation, and the patient made a good recovery. She remained quite well and became, in every respect, a good wife. So what was her disease? What was the indication for this operation? Her disease was her desire to obtain a divorce under the new Divorce Act. And the second one, picture a 20-year-old girl, she was disobedient to her mother's wishes, sent visiting cards to men she liked, and spent much time in serious reading. And I guess that there are many women in this room who would have been perfect candidates for this kind of operation. Um, the issue here is, 
Baker Brown was not alone. There were others, for example, Charcot, a very famous neurologist who taught at the well-known La Serpentrière Hospital in Paris. And he also believed that mental disease in women result from abnormalities or excitation of the female external genitalia. And behind me, you see in a picture, in the midst, um, there is Charcot, and he's surround, surrounded by his disciples. And then there is a woman having um, a hysterical attack. Um, these clinical rounds were absolutely famous. And if you look at this picture, what do you see? All men. Medicine was male at this point in time. And just picture for just one minute what happened there. All these men discussing in every detail, or maybe even viewing in pornographic detail the role of the clitoris and the vulva in the development of hysteric attacks. And it comes worse. Many of you might not be aware that Sigmund Freud, famous for psychoanalysis, attended those clinical rounds for five months. Okay, these are the really dark ages of sexual medicine. Many doctors are not aware of this, but I, I thought it would be very well valuable for you to know about this. So what about modern sexual medicine? Today, we focus on how do things work. And actually, Masters and Johnson, 46 years ago, introduced the first sort of scientific model of female sexual function. They proposed a linear model of sexual function um, for men and women. And all of you know this. Um, there is arousal, then there might be a plateau, then there is orgasm, and then there is resolution. And then, in 1979, Helen Singer Kaplan came along and said, oh, there's something missing. What about libido? What about desire? So desire came in. Desire came in at the beginning, the driving force behind sexual activity. And many of you in this room were brought up with this concept that sexual desire comes first, and then there is sex. But Think about this. Is this the truth? Spontaneous sexual desire, does this exist in women? Um, I'd like to challenge you for one second. The women in this room, maybe the men as well. Um, so why do you have sex? Or why do you think women in general have sex? Women who claim that they're happy with their sexual life. Not women saying, I'm absolutely unhappy with what's going on here. Um, you're done with this? Okay. So, science. What tells science you about this? It's about the desire to express love. It's about receiving and sharing physical pleasure. This is about um, feeling emotionally closer to your partner. This is about pleasing the partner, increase own well-being, and then there is this issue of self-image. Feeling attractive, desired, loved, feminine, appreciated. And then the last issue, women do not like to talk about it, but this is real. I sit in my office day by day and I listen to those women and this is what they say. Sex is used to reduce the feelings of anxiety or guilt about sexual infrequency. Um, what about desire? Do you see desire on this list? It's not on this list. If you sum up, this is about emotional intimacy. This is not about sexual desire as a starting point for sexual activity. And this is the basis for the new model. Um, it's also called the intimacy-based model by Rosemary Besson, um, saying that at the beginning there is sexual neutrality, but with a positive motivation. And the result of this is a willingness to become receptive, to actively find a sexual stimulus and focus on this sexual stimulus if the situation is adequate and the, uh, and the sexual stimulus is adequate. Um, this sexual stimulus is then processed within the brain um, with numerous factors influencing what's going to happen in the brain. But if things go well, subjective sexual arousal occurs. Um, if the sexual stimulation continues, the next step would be that the woman becomes excited, more and more and more excited, sex is more and more pleasurable, and then out of a sudden, there is the desire for sex itself, which hasn't been present in the beginning, but is now present. So this is completely different from the Kaplan model, with sexual desire in the beginning, 
Here, it's the sexual desire happening en passant. So if things go goes well, go well, and if the women stays focused, if the sexual stimulation is long enough and adequate, sexual satisfaction may occur with or without orgasm. So again, think about it. What was the reason to engage in sexual activity? This was about emotional intimacy. So it's absolutely important that there, is a, there are two positive outcomes here. On one hand, on a physical basis, this is the aspect of sexual satisfaction, and on the emotional side of the story, to further increase motivation to have sex again. Spontaneous desire might be present in the beginning of a relationship. Um, however, um, it of course smoothens the situation, but it's not present all the time. And if you think about this, well, um, there are many reasons why this doesn't work. Factors that might torpedo this sexual cycle. For example, if he is a poor lover, if he doesn't know what to do. Well, you can say this comes down to communication. But again, I mean, it could be an issue in some, in some, in, in, in some, uh, some situations. And then there is this multitasking thing. Women say, I can do everything at once. Okay, we try to do this. If you try to do two things at once, well, you might notice that both processes slow down. And if you try to do two things and once concerning sex, it simply doesn't work. And again, on top of that, being busy all the time with our brain, um, women have the difficulty to focus on what's going on. You know, she might, have, might be engaged in a sexual activity, and out of a sudden she thinks, okay, it's hot in here, and the room needs to be painted, okay. <laughs> And picture what happens, it's all gone. She's lost. So what about pain, distress, anxiety? If he suffers from erectile dysfunction, forget about this, it's not going to work. Okay, I've lost interest in sex. Um, let's have a look at the neurobiological perspective here. Um, let me digress for a second. Um, a short excursus and breath on, on brake and gas. So if you want to drive a car, you need to do two things. Number one, you need to release the brake. Number two, you need to accelerate. Otherwise, things don't work. If you try to do both things at once, you'll notice this doesn't work, okay? Um, okay, what does this have to do with sex? A lot. Okay, all behavior, including sexual activity, is influenced by two major factors. On one side, factors that inhibit a specific um, behavior, and on the other side, are factors that support or excite a specific behavior. This also applies to sexual activity. It's called the dual control model. Okay? Now, if we focus on sex, there are two things. There is inhibition on one side, and on the other side, there is excitation, triggers that cause arousal and desire. Um, but those two need to be balanced. So if you want to engage in sexual activity, um, you need to be able, on one hand, to decrease inhibition. We usually walk around in the inhibited mode, which is some, so something which is actually pretty smart. Picture what would happen otherwise. Societies wouldn't work, right? So, but on the other hand, you need some trigger at least, because spontaneous desire is rare. It might happen under certain circumstances, I'm going to talk about this in a minute, but usually it's not there, so we need a trigger. So you might say, wow, that's complicated, surprising that it works at all. I agree. Um, and I'd like to show you, you have already seen pictures like this, functional MRI data published a couple of years ago, but really interesting data. So what was done here is basically um, a research setting where a woman was stimulated, clitoral stimulation, and then it was measured what happens in her brain. So on the upper row, you see arousal, and on the lower row, you see what happens during orgasm. So you see blue and red dots. What is this? Red is an increase in perfusion, and blue is a decrease in perfusion. And there are lots of blue dots on the lower row. This is orgasm. And those dots are in a very critical area of your brain, frontal lobe. So you need to know, what is this good for? This is good for control. This is very basic, I have to agree, but basically, in, in essence, this is what the, the frontal lobe is good for. So if you 
want to experience an orgasm, you need to be able to give up control. That's what it's all about. But the issue is, this sounds so simple. It's not. It's not at all. If you can't focus on a sexual activity, or if you are, for example, distressed like hell, if you are anxious, if you are depressed, this does not work. There is no way to get aroused or to have an orgasm. It just doesn't work. Men are a little better off here uh, compared to women, but women really do have difficulties. So it doesn't come as a surprise that research has focused on what are the neurotransmitters involved here, and so what is on the gas side, and what's on the inhibitory side. And if you look at this on the gas side, there are neurotransmitters like dopamine, noradrenaline, oxytocin. Oxytocin has, has to do something with binding. Dopamine has something to do with the reward system. And um, the maladocorticoids that have something to do with appetite and sex. Eating, basically. So break, on the break side, we have others. We have 5-hydroxytryptophan, um, we have the opioids, and we have the endocannabinoids. So you might have heard 5-hydroxytryptophan. Um, it's metabolized to serotonin. So serotonin, does this ring a bell? If you are depressed, the doctor might put you on an SSRI um, that's a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So if you are on this drug, it might be great for your depression, but you know it's the break for sexual activity. Okay, so if you're depressed, you're really in trouble. There's one situation where you are sort of well, you, you suffer from neurosteroid intoxication, but most of us like this state. Um, so what happens here is. Your brain is flooded with those wonderful neurosteroids um, that make sex easy. Dopamine, noradrenaline, apparently, at least some studies suggest this, um, there is a decrease um, in men of testosterone, and in women there is an increase, but there are not that many data to support this. Um, and then after six months, um, well, what happens? They're after everything goes back to normal. Huh. This is the moment where you suddenly think, Okay, he's not that smart, is he? And he doesn't talk to me. So, I mean, this is the moment where you put off your glasses, yeah? No pink glasses anymore. So this is what this is all about. And there is this little difference. I'd like to do this briefly because I'm running over time otherwise. Men and women are not alike, and we, oops, and we all know this. Um, so the issue is, what happens? The hypothesis is a sexual stimulus is really going fast through a man's brain. This is called the quick and dirty pathway. With women, the situation is a lot more difficult. This is the neat and slow pathway, okay? It sounds funny, it's not, if you think about it. It's androgen-dependent and context-dependent. Well, that's smart, you know, given the imbalanced investment here. What does he invest? You know, we heard about this risk-taking thing this morning and testos being testosterone-driven, a sperm. What is her investment? A pregnancy. So it's actually pretty smart to think about this twice, right? But if you're in a longer-running relationship, then you are getting in trouble, OK? Um, I discussed this concept with a friend some time ago. We both sat in an airport lounge, and I sat, sat there and tried to explain this concept of differences between men and women. It's always funny. Um, OK, and then I looked at this plane, the jumbo, about to take off, and I thought, well, that's it. This is how female sexuality works. Before this plane leaves off, there are those checklists. And if there is one red light, the plane is not going to take off. <laughs> and then, and then, and then, you know, my friend said, okay, a male. He said, I got you. So men are like bicycles, just hop on and get off. Okay, you can't put it this way. So, um, you think you're in control? Well, we have learned a lot this morning about testosterone. No, you're not in control. Biology is in the driver's seat, and hormones are in the driver's seat. If you're a woman, you're at the mercy of your hormones. And the problem is, those hormones fluctuate throughout your cycle. In the second half of your cycle, your brain doesn't do what you, what it, what you want it to do. You know, Things are getting slower at the menstrual, men, around menstruation. You might feel miserable. Best time is shortly before ovulation. You know, women just feel fantastic. Day 11 till, till day 14, superb. Okay? 
Um, and if it comes to sex, this is the situation we are prone, when we are prone to have sex. Um, it can, actually, we even wear tighter dresses, okay? It's visible. You think it's not, it's not visible? It is visible. Men can see this, if they are trained at least. <laughs> Um, and if women view an erotic video, they re respond differently concerning brain scans, depending on which part of the cycle they are in. So you are not in control. Biology is driving the whole show. I mean, you are not. If you think you are, forget about this. Are there pills to boost sexual desire? Women come in my office and say, OK, I've lost interest in sex. Is there anything that I can do about this? And well, there are. What about hormones? In 1966, this book was published. And on the cover, it said, now almost every woman, regardless of age, can safely live a full sex life for her entire life. Well, this was the beginning of the hormonal replacement therapy story. By now, we know, well, things are by far not that simple. It doesn't work like this, but there are androgens. We've heard so many interesting things this morning in this brilliant talk about testosterone. Well, women do have testosterone as well, and it's important for women, absolutely. And by now, it's widely accepted that women who suffer from androgen deficiency have numerous symptoms concerning their sex life, but also concerning vitality, depressive symptoms, etc., etc., etc. And the wonderful thing is, testosterone works. Testosterone improves sexual function, desire, orgasm, um, responsive, responsiveness to sexual stimuli. Um, it also improves vitality. It improves depressive symptoms. It does all sorts of things. And this is not surprising given the fact that testosterone interacts with numerous neurosteroids that are involved in the development of depression, in the development of low sexual desire. So testosterone does work and it's available for women. So what does it do? Is this glass half empty or half full? That's the story, okay? And testosterone may shift you from half empty to half full, okay? Anything else? What about drugs affecting the central nervous system? And you have seen this picture already. I'd like to call those drugs balance modulators. It's a question of where are we? Are we on the brake side or are we on the gas side? And are we able to shift from the brake side to the gas side? And there are a couple of drugs under development. One almost made it to the market, flibanserin, last year, but the FDA said, no, we need more research. It worked actually pretty well. Um, there are other drugs out there who do the job. Um, so the question is, is sex tuning the future? Well, difficult question. And there are people out there who say, this is just merging of marketing and medical science. Um, and they claim that this is the making of a disease, female sexual dysfunction. Please don't get me wrong. I'm not here to say that low sexual desire is a disease. Not at all. If you are comfortable with your level of desire, perfect. This is what I'd like to see. But if you come to my office and say, I have lost interest in sex, and I suffer like hell. I don't have any idea what's going on here. Um, and this is about 10% of the women across all age groups. Well, maybe, maybe she would be a good candidate for a medication like this. She would like to have the chance to choose. And who am I to say, no, you don't get it, if it's available. But, you know, if you think about it, I've lost interest in sex. If we talk about this, it's always a question of, okay, who is suffering? Are you or is your partner? And then there is this issue of, um, I have lost interest in sex in relation to what? In relation to my own expectations, in relation to what I experienced in earlier times with other lovers, in relation to my husband's expectations or partner's expectations, in relation to society's expectations or what I think are society's expectations driven by the media. So you have to be quite clear on what does she really mean if she says she has lost interest in sex. And in the end, in many cases, it's not about drugs. It's about communication. And this is one of the reasons why all of us are here. Communication. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Annalisa, that was wonderful. And uh, of course, if you check your goodie bag, the DLD goodie bag, we have, of course, a sample with some testosterone in there. So uh, enjoy and please send us your feedback. Um, no, I'm just joking. Um, yes, now we're having uh, the third uh, very wonderful expert um, who is going, we've been talking quite a lot today about it, about uh, in social media, how important it is to when we are in contact, when we're willing to share, to be able to read the other person, and most of all, of course, when we see the other person. I'm looking now at Professor Tanja Singer, who's a wonderful neuroscientist coming from psychology, is this correct? And she is a world-renowned expert when it comes to empathy. She is the director of the Department of Social Neuroscience at the Max Planck Institute for Human Cognitive and Brain Sciences in Leipzig. And Professor Singer investigates the developmental, neural, and hormonal mechanism underlying human. She's specifically viewed as a word expert on empathy. Please welcome Dr. Tanja Singer. Please come up. So, um, you hear me? <laughs> so that was a very sexy story. I'm not sure whether I can tell you such a sexy story. Um, I'm just wondering, do you see what, is it not like the big screen? No, okay, so we leave it like that. So what I wanted to do is to introduce you first a little bit into uh, the field which is called social neuroscience. So it's a very young field, and actually super interdisciplinary. So there are like neuroscientists, psychologists, biologists. We also work with economists, philosophers, sociologists, anthropologists. So it's quite fun because it's very young. And the, 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 the goal is to actually understand the social brain and social behavior in terms of all these levels from, you know, behavior, society, to cognitive process, brain, hormones, and genes. So it's really trying to map kind of these levels and to understand not only how, you know, like social emotions, envy, schadenfreude, fairness, desires, you know, different motivational states act, but also uh, how does, uh, you know, the brain develops, which allows social communication and social skills to, to uh, formulate. And the other thing is, and I will talk about that shortly, is can we train our brain and our behavior uh, in these social capacities? Can we get better in communication and understanding other people and understanding their feelings? Um, and there is very, very little research in neuroscience about this very, very important question. It's like the question of plasticity. And I talked to uh, you a little bit today about that. Of course, we also look at what is going wrong when the social brain doesn't work, like in autism, depression, uh, you know, borderline personality, narcissistic pop you know, population and so on. And we also work with great apes because we wonder whether things like empathic concern, compassion, empathy, but also shame and these kind of social emotion are actually uniquely human or whether we share that with our relatives. And so today what I will do is just, of course, in this short time, focus on two aspects. And I thought I'd talk on empathy and the difference between empathy and uh, compassion because that's a very important difference and how we can train that and what it do, does for our brain, for our health, for our behavior. So let me first introduce you the terms I'm using. Um, so I, in, in the realm of empathy, you know, like sharing and understanding affect of the other, how do I know what the other is feeling, thinking? There is these kind of sisters of empathy and it starts with what we call emotion contagion. So in, in a very negative sense, if I would be like, ah, you know, I'm starting to do that. Um, and not too obvious, you would start like a priming experiment to yawn. And that would be what we call yawning contagion. But we also, and I have a, a movie here, uh, which shows, uh, because I'm a twin sister, so I love this movie, this is quadruple twins. And this is an example of laughing contagion. That is going to make you laugh now, ready? So it's like this. <laughs> <laughs> Stop. 
happy. You know, and then there's one starting again, and then the whole mafia goes back. Yay! Okay, so you see what I mean, and what we did for experiments, I mean, that's a, it's a very enjoyable contagion, you know, because the public gets cheered up. But what we also did, experiments on stress contagion. So if we stress people in, the, in a certain lab condition by giving public speech, you can stress people very easily with that, the cortisol level gets very high. But what is really interesting is if I measure your cortisol level by watching me getting stressed, in some people, more in women when they watch their partner than the male watching the female partner getting stressed, there is also a bit of a gender difference here. But uh, the cortisol level will also get, and that's cortisol contagion, that means that just by watching another person getting stressed, you're, you're getting stress on the hormonal level, not just on the level, you know, of affect and um, autonomic arousal. So we are, all these experiments just show you how closely interdependent and related we are on an unconscious level as we are processing so many of the emotions of other people but not even being aware of. And that's really important to keep that in mind. We are not so single divided units. We are really like interconnected through our brains and our uh, emotion contagion capacity. Now, the very important thing is that uh, this is not empathy yet or uh, so certainly not compassion. And empathy needs to have a conscious self other distinction. So for empathy to arise, now you have pain, for example, and I now sharing your pain, so I have the same emotion, but I know it's not my emotion. I know it's clearly coming from you, which in emotion contagion you don't know. You just are. You just got it like a virus. Um, and empathy emerges only after ki kids started to have self other distinction until you know, they realized I'm different than the mother. Now, a lot of people talk about empathy, you know, like in the press and also web page, as something in principle good and prosocial. You know, we need to have more empathy. And it took me quite a while myself, and I will show you actually which experiment led to understanding for me the difference between empathy and compassion. And what we really want to train and to have is compassion. Empathy is a precursor and is good, but if you have too much of it, you can go into distress and actually antisocial behavior like, you know, closing down, putting people up. So it's the capacity to go in affect resonance, but you need to know how to transform it into what we call uh, compassion, which is a warm, caring feeling and a motivation for the other. And that has a very different feel to it, and I'll come to that later so that you understand this distinction better. And why are we interested in all this change? Of course, because we want to know what are the motivational driving factors to make us people not just egoistically behaving narcissists, but like for socially motivated cooperators in society. And then another very important distinction is that there are very different routes how I can come to the understanding of the other. This kind of red root is the affective root, is like a resonance, which is an affective resonance. Now there is also a cognitive perspective taking root, or it's called mentalizing or theory of mind. And for example, the best um, example to imagine the difference is psychopaths are super good in the cognitive perspective root. They know exactly which desires you have, intentions, they can manipulate you very well, they're very charming. That's a defining criteria for psychopathy. But what they lack is actually an affective root, which will also then hinder them to be aggressive or uh, engage in violent behavior. So there is these two different roots which usually interact, but in some psychopathology can dissociate to the understanding of the other. The other doesn't feel. It's like a cognitive understanding of the other. And that's not just a philosophical distinction, but it's also a different circuitry in the brain. So this kind of cognitive capacity to understand others develop much later and is based on prefrontal structures and, uh, you know, like late developing also in ontogeny uh, structure, whereas empathy, the affective resonance, is based on limbic, paralimbic structure and, you know, like very early developing structure which code for feelings and somatosensory bodily states. So let me show you how we in social neuroscience try to tackle this problem. You see, when, when we started with this empathy research, first, you know, lots of males said, how will you ever measure something you don't even feel? I mean, something which the other feel, I mean, already measuring emotion is a bit scary, but like then emotion which is not even yours. And then, you know, when you have been lying in a brain, it's not very social in terms of you lying, I don't know, a lot of people perhaps have li been lying in a, in a 
in a scanner like this because of clinical exams and you are like kind of lying there, you cannot move a lot and it's very loud. So how, how to induce empathy? And what we did in this very early experiment is to ask couple to come in and the husband would sit next to the scanner, the wife would lie in the scanner and then we induced painful stimuli. But it wasn't like a sadistic motivation, it's just because we know quite a lot about what we call the pain matrix. So what is the, the network in the brain which really poses pain when you have pain? And we, were, we induced like bee stings. It's a bit like, eh, but just one second without consequence and people come back happily to our lab again and again. So sometimes the fear of pain is bigger than when, when you really receive it, you know. So, but we needed to kind of find a salient example to start measuring this kind of affective resonance. So, I just show you a very bad movie because in a magnet you cannot do really fancy movie. Uh, so, you see here they can talk at the beginning and this is the pain electrodes and through a mirror system she can see, you know, flashes either pointing to her hand giving her pain and we can measure the brain when she really gets pain. Or she see her husband suffering pain, she knows, ow, oh, now he is suffering but he, she doesn't see anything, she just know now, now this me, ow, I feel it, yeah? It's like my pain matrix and the brain lights up. Then here I'm like, oh, now my husband getting shocks or sometimes it's tickling. And when it's like, ouch, now he's... Just... So now the question is, do we activate parts of the pain matrix which is actually coding my own pain when we know that another person is in pain we care for? And now empathy research has been, uh, you know, flourishing, so we can do already summary statistics over lots of studies in the whole world. So it's a meta-analysis. And what you typically show is that the green part is when you get pain and the red part is empathy for pain. And that's a formal analysis. You see this insula, and we have seen in the, pre in the first talk a slide on insula. Insula is our interoceptive cortex. It's a part in the brain which receives information about pain, but also about lust, about sensual touch, about temperature, about uh, everything which is in the body. So this is why we call it interoceptive cortex, because it's basically, this is what in the talk about the testosterone this morning was mentioned about the interaction between brain and body. The insula is basically mapping what happens in the brain and also maps the aversive feeling of pain. And you reactivate this very emotional activation which underlie your own feeling of pain when the other is in pain. Okay, so you really go into resonance by feeling the pain of the other. Okay, so at that time everyone was really excited and saying, oh, so the brain is pre-wired to get into effective resonance. We are kind of always empathic with everyone. And then I said, you know, obviously our society is rather characterized by a lack of too much empathy I mean, than, you know, having all the time the feeling of empathizing with everyone. So we started to look at the factors which actually blocks our empathy. What are the factors which make this empathy uh, going down? You know, this kind of affective resonance which we have the capacity, all we have the capacity for that. So, the first thing, we looked at a patient group, but you could also take it as a personality trait. So, uh, you sh I mean, like bad tongues say that that is a personality trait which is a bit more present in males, and that's called alexithymia, and I have just, um, you know, pictured Mr. Spock here, because it's basically people, when you are very alexithymic, you don't know what you feel. You're like wet and anger, you know, like, oh, and you're like, what are you feeling? And it's like, I mean, is it fear, anger? <laughs> and so if it's very, very pronounced, that can get very, very bad. You can imagine if you don't have access to your feeling at all, these people usually end up in psychotherapy. But not so that you don't feel too safe, you can find 10% of you being very alexithymic if I would pick you out. So what we did is to show that the relationship between understanding your own feeling and empathy is basically very close. So if you don't activate the insular cortex while you have to say what you are feeling, you're also not able to activate it if you feel for others. So you also have a lack of empathy. So every empathy training should always start with interoceptive training. You first have to understand your own bodily feeling state. You have to look inside and getting better in understanding your bodily feeling, training your insular cortex, you could say, because that's the basis for every uh, um, you know, social cognition and empathy. Okay, then we did another experiment 
we wanted to know, and I don't give away the data already, but we wanted to know whether not only like person characteristic, like Alexisheimia, you know, or Asperger's or autism, uh, but also contextual factor. I mean, like basically we wanted to know, can we bring people into the scanner situation and make them from Mother Teresa to a psychopath? Can we just switch this motivation from empathy to the opposite, which we call Schadenfreude in Deutsch. Uh, in English, it's gloating or shameful joy. And we wanted to know, is that possible? For example, if, and we, the first thing we looked at is perceived fairness, because I was working in new economics. So I was working with these economic games, and I saw that if you engage people in monetary social exchange game of fairness, you can very easily make someone feel very uh, you know, like uh, pleased and fair. So, you know, what I do is like one person engage in fair play with you and the other is always keeping the money, not reciprocating and so you will start defecting on you and you will start really hating this person. Now, if you put them into this empathy for pain paradigm, now the fair person on your left gets pain, the unfair person on the right gets pain and you get scanned. We can look whether the empathic signal for the unfair is different than for the fair person because of the prehistory you had with this person. And what you saw here is gender difference. So whereas the females empathized in the anterior insula for, for the fair player and the unfair player, even though the females said, I didn't really like this person when they kind of cheated on me in monetary exchange game, you see the good news is the male have empathy actually in the same areas when the person was fair. But the bad news, or let's say evolutionary probably good news, is that there was a complete absence of an empathic response in males when the unfair player get punished. And you will see later that instead of these empathic response, there was a reward signal going lighting up, which was correlated to the desire for revenge in Schadenfreude. But only in male, not in female. Okay, so then we wanted to know, is it only fairness which modulates this empathy? Or can we also find the same for a group identity, in-group, out-group identity? And we took football because football is just such a good example for in-group and out-group. And so we engaged actors actually and they pretended that they would be football fan of your own club or the rival club. It was uh, FC Basel and FC Zurich because I was in Zurich. And you see, if the apparently out group member, rival football team member gets pain, not a lot of empathy in the anterior insula. <laughs> if your in-group member gets huge, huge empathic response. Okay, the, 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 the other side of the medal basically is uh, what we would call, uh, you know, desire of revenge or schadenfreude. So, when the male, but not the female, saw the unfair player suffering pain, they showed an increase in nucleus accumbens, which is a dopaminergic projection area and involved in reward processing. And when we asked them, did you, did you actually enjoy to see them suffering? They said, yes. You know, there was a desire for revenge and for, you know, taking revenge on unfair play. And that came with a signal in the nucleus accumbens. And when we did another experiment to see how these antagonistic signals, like either a signal in the empathy insula area, that predicted prosocial behavior. But whenever the nucleus accumbens was up and the Schadenfreude was high, empathy was down, and that predicted a lack of behavior. So to summarize these things, I bought your movie. This is like. Basically, no empathy left, antisocial behavior. <laughs> but this, uh, this experiment suggests that probably the penguin had either de defected on you first or you think he's an outgroup member. <laughs> so the, the, the summary of this first period was that actually the good news is that our brains are really tuned to emotional and affective resonance. Um, and that it activates brain regions in our body which process our own feeling state and interoceptive body states. Um, and that empathy should always start with training yourself and understanding your own feelings better. Um, but that you can also, within very normal healthy subject, you don't need to be a psychopath or something, uh, inhibit basically this empathic response very easily just because you think you don't even have evidence that this person is not your little in-group member. It's an outgroup member or was unfair. So it's a very, very fragile system. And you can uh, switch one back and forth. So 
So the next uh, uh, phase of this research was, of course, can we do something about this biological imprinting? I mean, we have this capacity for post-social motivation and empathy, but it's so fragile. We just need to, we just, you know, someone tells me that half of this group are not, is out group. They are like, I don't know, they're group A and group B. I start developing in-group, out-group discrimination. I will have lots of empathy if I see you suffering and nothing for this. And I can, I mean, I can predict 80% of you would do that. It's very, very biologically imprinted, you know, this in-group, out-group discrimination. So we wanted to know, can we do something about it by training? Can we actually get better in not discriminating in-group, out-group and getting empathy flourishing for more people and really like activate for social motivation as much as you can train your muscles or you can train, you know, mathematical skills. And at that time, there was actually nothing really around uh, in the field, you know, there was basically uh, lots of plasticity research in the motor domain, in the cognitive domain, in the, you know, language, but no one was really doing research on can you train your affective brain? Can you do something to increase social positive emotion? So I had to look for experts first. This is how you usually start. You measure experts which are really, really good. And the experts I found was in the cooperation with the Dalai Lama in the Mind and Life Conference, where this is all Western Nobel Prize trigger and winner, which are in a dialogue every two years since 20 years with contemplative East, East, East uh, science, meditation, a practitioner which are here and philosopher and they discuss how Western science can influence contemplative science in the other way around and they are hugely interesting dialogues. I have learned a lot uh, from them and the good thing is that the Dalai Lama has encouraged these long-term mental training specialists who do that over 30 years every day to basically not only be tested in 4,000 meter high in their meditation huts in the Himalaya but come down to our labs so some of them, this is Mingyo Rinpoche, he's called the meditation, uh, the Mozart of meditation. He has started to do three-year retreats with 11-year-old. So when you look at his brain, you're just thinking this is not real. This is, for a brain scientist, this is like, wow. Um, and this is Mathieu Ricard, who became a real friend, and he was a researcher himself, a microbiologist in France, and so he knows both worlds. He knows the world of mental training because he had been 30 years practicing, but he also knows the Western science, so that's a really good translator. And we did a lot of experiments to know which area he would basically activate in the brain when he goes into this prosocial motivation and compassion and this positive affect. And what was very interesting is that I said, you know, please empathize with the suffering of someone you imagine. And he showed a very different network than what I had seen, you know, in hundreds and hundreds of people before when I did the empathy for pain experiment. So I said to Mathieu when he came out, what, what are you doing? Are you not suffering, not empathizing with them? Because you are activating a network which is actually a positive reward and affiliation network, which we see being involved in affiliation. And he said, no, what I'm doing is actually activating this kind of warmth, loving, caring feeling, which a mother would activate towards a crying child. It's coming out of the caring system. And so we engaged with Olga, because that was really interesting, in a study where we wanted to, in people like you and me, who had never done these kind of mental training techniques, didn't know anything about it, whether we could, after a week, find evidence that you can enhance this empathic versus compassionate network and whether they will be different. And the idea is that we wanted to know whether when we train this kind of warm, caring feeling, actually you, you increase positive affect and when you train empathy, you actually sensitize to negative and to the suffering. You get more negative, which would have huge implication for healthcare services and for every, you, you see the suicidal rate in medical profession is huge. It's a huge problem. And this is because of affective resonance with your suffering patients you have to deal every day. And so we want to find a route which actually don't lead in burnout, poor health with withdrawal, cynicism, or, or you know, exhaustion because of being too much confronted you know, with trauma victims or with suffering in the world. And we could also show that after a week, using kind of interactive computer games, post-social behavior increased after compassion training. 
So that made us really, really confident that actually mental training in adult, you know, grown up, not in children, in adults like you and me, is possible and can have wide-ranging effects on how you cope with stress and materials. So with the help of a huge European research ground, we are now investigating in a one-year longitudinal project. So we will take 200 people and train them in different mental faculties over a whole year. Every day, you know, you do 20 minutes of mental training. It's like you would basically go in a fitness club, but you don't do muscle training, but you do mental training of different aspects. And the idea is that we want to find solution to actually help uh, to solve problems which are really increasing in our society. This is like increasing depression rates, burnout rates, stress-related diseases, um, but also increasing levels of narcissism, egocentrism, which is heavily to do with our way we educate children. And uh, this leads, this is very closely tied to depression rate, because if you are always responsible for everything which happens in the world, and you always have to be the best in achieving the best, you know, you cannot do that and you will fall. So if you are interested to take part in that, give me an email. And I think this is the team which support this work. And these uh, are the names behind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think that was really very exciting. Professor Singer, thank you very much. Now I'd like to call the other speakers up on stage. Herr Ilger, Hosinger, sit down, please. And I told you that you now have the opportunity to ask some questions to those wonderful experts. But uh, maybe to start with, I, I start with a very practical question that um, I give to all of the three of you. Uh, starting with you, um, what, at now at the end, now that you presented your, find, you presented your findings here, what can we practically learn, take out of this? How should we change our behavior regarding to priming? I think the first step is realizing that priming is everywhere. And uh, to bring it from a subconscious level into a conscious level, if it's a conscious level, uh, the likelihood that this is influencing you on a subliminal level is reducing. And this is, I think, the primary way because a lot of influencing is negative, like advertisements and so on. Should we use this priming idea? I mean, I could prime myself positively by listening to a song. Is this priming yes, when course. I am in a good yeah, mood after yeah. listening to a song, or is this not priming? I, I think there's a difference when you drive with your car to your work and you will hear a song instead of news or even bad news, and this will change your behavior later on at least half a day. And this is what you would call priming too. So we basically, we could use it very actively, right? We could, I think we can, and we use it very actively. Of I course, basically, yeah. we should tell all our friends and husband or whatever, or wives, uh, prime me positively, darling, and don't dare to prime me in any negative way, basically, right? Yeah, negative, it's all the time. Yeah. Does it work in your relationship? So in... <laughs> <laughs> if it works in your relationship. No, 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 okay, what should we learn, what can we learn from your findings, how, what should we do, what should we change after what you told us? Um, that's difficult, I guess the first and, and most important issue here is start talking about sex, it's so basic, I mean, there are all those wonderful drugs out there, testosterone is available for women, and after you've heard my talk, you might feel, I'd like to get that, as you said, you know, we put it in this little package. Um, but on the other hand, um, I think you, if you have difficulties, at least that's my impression in my office, in many cases, just couples don't talk. And if you start talking about those critical issues, things might improve. Just by talking, you reduce or you might reduce distress. If, I, if someone comes in my office and says, I've lost interest in sex, and if she starts talking about this, just by talking, I'm not saying that we are at the end, having a solution for her problem. But just by talking about it, putting it on the table, things might get better. But, you know, in some cases, testosterone would be a good idea, you know, because it is helpful. And I see so many women, I have lots of women on testosterone, and it works, but you have to be careful. Um, it's not good for everybody, um, but it's really impressive if these women say, I feel more vital, um, I feel more energetic, um, it has changed my life, and well, this I, is really babe, impressive. 
Will I have beard growth? Will no. I have my muscles growing? My voice is lowering? You know, we are not talking no? about tuning. We are not talking about muscle tuning, and we are not, you know, this won't happen because this is really low dose. Um, I know that there are some colleagues out there who use preparations that were designed for the use in men. Don't use these in women because they are just too high dose. They are, there is one, um, drug, one, one medication out there who's specifically designed for women. Um, that's something you could use. Um, because otherwise, you might end up with exactly this. You know, you don't want to have a beard, right? And pimples all over. Yeah, no, no thanks. Horrible. No. <laughs> uh, Professor Singer, thank you so much for your wonderful talk about empathy. Why should we be empathic and why should we learn it? Uh -huh. Or learn it in the sense of why should we exercise it? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, like, um, first, I think, I, I hope that I could convene the matter that it's rather than empathy, it's compassion. So, for the people who have no empathy at all, you want to start with empathy. <laughs> but then when people have a lot of empathy anyway already, you want to show them actually how to, how to change that in compassion so that they don't get overwhelmed by being too connected, you know, especially when confronted with suffering. So, we are all confronted with suffering, stress of the other, of the partner, you know, in some... Teachers are immensely, you know, um, and so we are starting to uh, implement these training programs in schools for teachers and for the kids, you know, how to cope with your inner world, with your emotions, with your negative emotion, your anger, and how to actually use these kind of caring and self compassionate system for yourself to reduce your own stress. So it's, uh, you know, it's I always call it a win-win situation because if you are in your compassionate system, it's good for you and for the other. <laughs> so it's a win-win situation. Yeah. You know, you, it increases your social behavior, your caring actions because that's the system. But it also reduces your own stress, anxiety level through direct inhibition of the biology in yourself. So it increases your health to be compassionate and the welfare of the others. Do you, do you personally do something to increase your ability of compassion? Yeah, so we, we, we try to, uh, you know, exercise everything we kind of want to give to our subjects, <laughs> ourselves. So we are constantly going into retreat. Now we are just training 25 teachers for our one-year longitudinal study. So we sit all the time in kind of retreat light session in our work days. <laughs> so basically, when we come and see you, you would all sit there and meditate? Yeah, and I mean, you can also do it on a chair or in standing <laughs> position. It's not, I always say meditating has this kind of, you know, like, woo. It's actually mental training, you know, it's like sports, you know, and there are very different mental techniques, you know, from affective one, attention related ones, you know, breathing, uh, metacognition, watch what is going on, you know, watch your thought. It's a bit like when you would say sports, you have tennis, you have golf, you have swimming, and they are very different. And so, you know, mental training technique can be very different. And we focus in the one-year longitudinal study on all, you know, from attention to cognitive perspective taking. You know, being able, if you have a very different attitude, being able to really understand what your attitude is and not confound it with my own. And for that, you need to train a muscle to really detach from myself and take this perspective. And if we don't have that, that leads to communicational misunderstanding and to nearly, you know, can fights and, you know, even on political level, that's very often the beginning of a spiral of, you know, revenge. Definitely yeah. is. Does anyone here already have a question? Oh, I would go on. You have a question over there. Caroline. Hello. Hello. Uh, that's for Tanya Singer. Uh, do you measure any difference between cultural groups, say like Swiss people would react in a different way as, uh, say, Brazilian people? Oh, uh, a cross-cultural difference. Unfortunately, we are not there yet. We are happy to do this research in Germany right now. Uh, but there are, for example, some uh, research center in America which does do the similar training, compassion training, mental training, and they find the same results. So, um, you know, there, there, there are certainly cross-cultural differences, but the system I'm speaking of, which we train, are universal. You find them even in animals. <laughs> Sorry to say that, but... <laughs> <laughs> I have one more question uh, for Professor Elger. Um, Hearing what you said about priming, terrible example about the judge who then would, you know, relate his, his judgment. How you say, send the guy longer in prison if he dies to a higher number. Uh, and he, remembering as well what John Coates said about uh, the risk behavior and the influence of the, risk, the testosterone on risk behavior in men. 
can we trust our decisions? How do we get to any kind of rational decision at the end of the day? No, I think we can trust our decisions on a high level if you think about things. But if for fast decisions, we are under the influence of all these systems. These can be very different. These can be hormones on one day, can be priming on another day. For example, if you go shopping and you have a sign, this is a bio, uh, let's say, tomatoes, yeah, you are much more able or you're much more likely to pay much more money just because in your mind this bio is somehow related to healthy, which has been never proven. It's not, not a proven thing. On the other hand, if you make an experiment and you say, this is gene-manipulated uh, food, the people wouldn't take it. But if you reduce the price dramatically, another thing comes, and then they buy it. And if you ask the people, why did you buy this gene-manipulated food? When you first thought it is wrong, they said, ah, oh, it's very cheap, and it's just one case, so it doesn't matter. So I think decision-making is extremely complicated, especially if it's very fast. So I think the, the very special momentary situation of the brain finally decides what you do. But if you start thinking upon a thing, then other things come into foreground. Any question from the public? Here. Hello. Would so, you like to introduce yourself so we know? My name is Katrin Buckenmeier and I'm the CEO of a startup company in Russia. So I have a question with regards to um, what each of you actually have been saying. So that a lot of these positive things of positive priming or let's say mental training that you can get engage in in order to change empathy towards compassion is actually a problem which particularly people with underlying symptoms such as depression or anxiety suffer from. Have you done actually any sort of research which shows the receptiveness of these people who suffer of these underlying symptoms to these you know, positive priming or mental training? Or is that something which in effect can only help people which are already healthy to get even better? So uh, it's a very good question and um, first I'm always talking about not, you know, the usual insanity. I mean, uh, if I would measure the stress level most of you guys are in every day, I, I guess you are all very high in cortisol. So, uh, you know, you could say you are all healthy on some level, but on another level, you, you, you have, I mean, you know, burnout is, uh, and, and stress-related uh, diseases increasing exponentially, not in psychopathological groups, but in CEO position, you know, and kind of completely what you would call healthy, normal adults sitting here. So I think, you know, that's one issue. And then the other issue, similar training program, but they have to be adapted, work well for borderline patients. It's like the interactive, theory. it's also on acceptance and motivation system. For depressed people, it's very difficult. So you need to be, careful not to go directly into the system with compassion because a lot of people who have been wounded in, their, in, this, in this attachment system very early on because of trauma, uh, if you go and activate the system right away, it will hurt because all your grief and hurt and trauma is basically based there. So you need to be careful and go so, but these are the people who profit most if you go over longer times. And that's like what compassion-based therapy is doing. So that's a therapeutic one-to-one -one relationship with people who had been heavily traumatized. Uh, so it works in patient groups, in, but you have to adapt it to the specific patient group, and it works for the normal Wahnsinn, the normal insanity we have <laughs> in our societies. Do you want to answer too, Christian? I think there's not much to add. I think you always have to see that patient groups start to become very difficult to investigate because the phenotype of the patient is so highly variable. We do a lot of research on patients and finally end up that study one gives this result, study two gives this result, and study three gives this result. Because we, it's very difficult to break down the phenotype of a certain disease on a, on a very comparable level. And so there are so many factors, so most of the time we are very happy to understand these things on a normal level and uh, pathophysiology increases it. Maybe one question to Anneliese Schwenkhagen, um, because you were talking about uh, when women come to see you and mm -hmm. say, I have lost interest in sex, and then you said, in relation to what? Mm -hmm. uh, with all those influencing factors, the partner, the society, myself, or whatever, 
how at the very end of the day am I going to find my own sexuality? Is there something like this I can identify? Do I have to meditate to get there? No, you say, no, don't meditate, why not? <laughs> you can. Yeah. Well, yes. I agree. Oh. Um, I, I totally agree to, you, to, to what you just said. You know, it's, it's about looking inside. What do I need? It's not, about, um, it's not about what does society tell me, as I said. And okay, in a relationship that is loving, um, tender, caring, as I said, if you ask women, why do you engage in sexual activity? Those women say, this has to do something with um, my partnership. This has to do something with bonding. Um, and, you know, if, you, if you're strictly feministic, you may say, she's not interested in sex at this point. Why does she have sex? But in a way, I mean, what is wrong with this if you, in the end, have good sex? You know, given the fact you didn't have desire in the beginning. I'd like to ask the question the other way around. Is something wrong with a couple who are loving and nice and everything to each other, but they don't have sex? Is no, this if they are happy with it, I think that's fine. I mean, who am I? If they think they are happy with it, and if both are happy with it, what's wrong? Obviously. <laughs> so, any, any other question from the public? Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Marta and I'm the head of insights at North Zone, an investment fund, technology investment fund. Um, as far as I can tell, we have, you know, the um, be grounded approach, be there, be in the moment. We have the communicate openly approach and then we have the manipulate subconsciously <laughs> approach. Um, my question is about perception. Where does perception come into all of this? Because my communication might be really good in terms of what I think of it, but if, an, if somebody else perceives the music that I play for them whilst priming them in a different way, in an unexpected mm -hmm. way, mm -hmm. is there a way of detecting these patterns? Is there a way of, of um, is there a formula basically for say manipulation or communication or whatnot that will work? like a positive feedback mechanism or something. And I'm not really sure who I'm, whom I'm asking here. It's a bit of everyone. Thanks. Now, if, if you do experiments with priming, you see it works quite easily. For example, we did tests in a selling room for cars, and if a family comes in and you have a film in the background running with a family car and certain items of this family car, uh, it's much easier for the people to sell this kind of car instead of having a sports car running in the background. And if you change all these things, you can increase the selling rate for this specific situation, this office, considerably. So you can really prove that this works. And it, uh, I think it works dramatically. Yeah, it's, it's, it's underestimated and, and we just don't realize it because it's, it's unconscious. It's, it, it produces a memory in us which we don't realize. We realize it later, finally, that we, we have been manipulated. Perhaps I can just add that mental training, if you do it long uh, enough, attentional training specifically, um, can alter your perception of things. And so, for example, what has been subliminal primings before, which you would have not seen and it would have been unconscious can become into, get into your window of consciousness because you get more and more fine about perceiving things you would not have seen before. So you can basically also train and change level of consciousness of which threshold you need to actually perceive things changing in your environment or being conscious or unconscious. Consciousness is a dimensionality, it's not an all or none. And you can, you can train your consciousness which is also looking inside and mental, and that will change also how you perceive change blindness phenomena and so on, and that could be found in, in long term, uh, you, know, you know, everything you do just one day will not change you, but like when you do it over a, a regular period, you can change your perception. So one very last question over there. Is it because talking about epigenetic analysis, you said that uh, it's so important uh, that women that tend to be fat yeah. have well, a we high... Now have, we now have data that show that women in pregnancy 
who are overweight may cause, or this may have a very negative impact on the kids, um, for example, for specific endocrine diseases like polycystic ovary syndrome, like um, being overweight. So, so the question what happens in the pregnancy um, is, is, key, is of key importance. It's all about priming, yeah? Pr this prenatal priming, this is really, we have no idea about this. The last question, please. Hi, Grosner, I'm CEO of Sanoma Media for Russian CE. I have a question for Professor Singer. Uh, is, do you cooperate somehow uh, with the police? What is the practical uh, implication? The police or... Oh, uh, police. You know, to avoid risk situations. Oh, okay. or does your training have any practical yes. uh, implications? So I'm a, a fundamental researcher working at Max Planck. So obviously I'm, my job is to you know, to get a better grasp on the mechanism, how it works, what it changed in terms of so. But these programs are now uh, used and we will, we will uh, publish an electronic book for free in three months, it will be on our webpage, on all the possible application of mental training program in schools, uh, in prisons, in, uh, with dying, with people who, in healthcare, in end of life care. We don't have something about sexuality, so you might, yes, you might <laughs> write a chapter. <laughs> and this is really a book which is written for the popular, you know, it's not the scientific kind of difficult text. And there will also be the training programs which is developed in different centers right now, uh, a really printed session by session so that school teacher can apply them. You know, you can really start experimenting with these exercises. You will have videos you can click on where you see how that works, you know, how the instruction works. So it, it should have wide uh, practical application, but we want to do the scientific backbone, you know, and also get more information who is profiting from what at which time, you know, because it will not be like everyone is just as happy with every form of training, yeah? So, uh, you know, another year or two, I can give you much more information. <laughs> So definitely, uh, Tanya Singer, we will try to uh, re-invite re you. We will re-invite you. We hope you're going to come back. You too, Annelise, and you, of course, too, Christian. Thank you very much for your insight, of your knowledge. I think they were, uh, for me, very inspiring. I hope for you, as inspiring as for me, and new knowledge. Thank you very much to the three of them. You're welcome.